Hey, so there is Representative Craig Horn, and we're here at the home of Lucina Armasunian, and we have some folks in attendance here for Americans for Comprehensive Education Reform's first uh, fundraising event. So now we're going to have uh, Representative Horn answer some questions about the state of legislation in North Carolina and some of the bills and things that they're working towards now. So um, just to open things up, uh, can you give us a, just a brief example of what some highlights are of the session? Well, right now we are in the budget process. In, in 2019, the budget begins in the House, and then it moves to the Senate. The Senate today, as a matter of fact, will be voting out their version of the budget. On May, a couple of weeks ago, May, early May, the House voted out their version of the budget. The budget began in the House. And now moves to the Senate. The Senate will replace the House version with their version, send it back to the House, and the House will say, we don't agree, we will not concur. And at that point, which will happen next week, each, both the, uh, the President Pro Tem of the Senate and the Speaker of the House will appoint conferees. These generally are the chairman of the individual areas of the budget, education, Justice, Public Safety, Health and Human Services, Transportation, etc. They, the chairman of those committees in the House and the Senate will then sit down as a group and hammer out the differences between the two budgets. All we can deal with are those areas in contention. That is to say, well, let's take an example. The House passed a teacher pay raise the Senate passed a teacher pay raise. They're not the same pay raises. So the conferees will sit down and determine what is the pay raise we're going to go with. And that will go with all of the various pieces and parts of every budget, whether it be education, transportation, justice, public safety, as I said. We will then reassemble the budget as one new budget. It will then go back to both the House and the Senate for a vote up or down. No more amendments, no, well, we'll debate the heck out of it. We can, <laughs> we can talk anything to death. It's ridiculous. But the budget will go back through committee and, and then to the floor for a vote up or down. If it's voted up, we'll have now a concurrence budget, and that will then go to the governor. It's fully well expected that the governor will veto whatever it is the legislature comes up with. Okay, now that kicks the budget back to the legislature. The legislature will then either override the veto, which takes three-fifths vote, and remember, neither house now has a supermajority, so under any circumstances, it's going to have to take a bipartisan vote to, over to overturn the veto. If we overturn the veto, it does not go back to the governor. It's overturned and the budget now becomes law. If we're unable to overturn the veto, we will then reconfigure the budget and, send, and it's, the process starts all over again and it'll go back to the governor until such time as everybody agrees or the government, governor decides not to veto it, but he doesn't sign it and then it becomes law within a certain amount of time. So versus, whereas in the federal government, the president can pocket veto a bill. In the state government, there is no pocket veto. You either veto it or you don't. And if you don't veto it, it becomes law. Of course, you can sign it and it goes and it becomes law. Now here's the real challenge. I've just given you kind of a, of a messy overview but one of the things that's a big concern to all of us is that the state of North Carolina funds a large number of activities with what is called non-recurring money, that is one-time money. It's money appropriated for a given period of time. The given period of time is a fiscal year. That fiscal year ends June 30th. So activities funded with non-recurring money end on June 30th. And there are a lot of those activities. Any in education? A lot of those activities in education. We have a lot of professional development programs, after school programs, uh, 
uh, student support programs, counseling programs. We've got a lot of programs that we fund with non-recurring money. Those programs will end on June 30th if there's no budget. Now, I say that knowing that there is some untested water here. That is to say, we don't know firmly whether we could actually fund some of those programs with surplus carry forward. Because as we've all recently heard, the state of North Carolina has enjoyed a significant surplus in revenues this year. So what happens with that money? Can we fund non-recurring programs with some money out of surplus carryover? There are some people who say, yeah, we can do that. And there are other people who say, no, the budget is clear. These programs were funded for one year, and that year ends on June 30th, period. And therefore, those programs are gone. And there's going to be a lot of people laid off, a lot of kids unserved. And it's not just in education. We're going to see these kind of things in justice and public safety, transportation products, projects, and particularly in health and human services. But we do a lot of outside contracting, a huge amount of outside contracting with non-recurring money. And those programs are going to go away unless we figure out a way. Now, there's one more option not to continue to muddy the waters, and that has to do with reversions. Reversions. That Reversions are money that were, was appropriated to, let us stay with education, appropriated to DPI. The DPI didn't use. At the end of the year, they are required to revert that money to the general fund. Now, can we use reversions to fund these non-recurring appropriations that were in the 2018-19 budget? Well, some people say yes. Some people say no. What it boils down to is we've got a mess. It also boils down to the fact that we've got members, House and Senate members, and a governor that may draw a line in the sand. What I mean by that is if the governor or members of the legislature say, we're not voting for a budget unless it has X. And let's use the one that's most frequently spoken, talked about, and that is uh, uh, universal health care. Socialized medicine. Medicaid. If we don't have Medicare in the budget, we're not voting for the budget. That's a line in the sand. We could have great projects, and we do, a lot of great projects in the budget. But because it doesn't have that one, we've got some people that have committed themselves to not vote for the budget. Now, for me, frankly, uh, that is an unwise decision for legislators to ever put themselves in a corner. Don't do that. I, I tell legislators all the time, and with all due respect to organizations, don't sign a pledge. Don't sign any pledges because you can't predict the future. We've got a lot of legislators that, that sign a no tax pledge. I won't vote for a single bill that increases taxes. Let's paint yourself into a corner. You can't tell the future. And there may be a difficult circumstance where you really need to, you're just going to have to. No one really wants to increase taxes. Well, these days I'm not so sure. I think we do have people that are quite anxious to increase taxes. But most of us don't want to increase taxes. Well, that's, and that's a good policy. But don't paint yourself into a corner. There should be no litmus test. There should be no... Uh, line in the sand. We are elected to govern, and that should be what what draw what guides us. What how do we govern well? And you don't govern based on a single issue. We so, have a lot of one issue people, and it's not just in education or just in healthcare. You can't do that. So that's kind of an overview of where we are. Well, this will all play out over the next five or six weeks, probably a little quicker than that. Um, the goal is for us to be out of here, to have passed a budget well before the end of June. The reason that's the goal is because local government depends on, needs to know what they have to do into the next fiscal year starting July 1st. 
So with our state budget passed and signed into law by July 1st or well before July 1st, we've left boards of education, local governments, and all kinds of service providers kind of hanging out there. Are they going to be funded or not? And, and, if, and if, so, if they are going to be funded, to what level? So it's, uh, this, this, is, this is the tough time. Well, what, do you, what goals have you guys set for this session in terms of just to focus on education? Uh, any particular bills, any particular things that you're maybe championing? That well, you're... And I'll, let's talk about the House budget because that's a budget that's actually passed. Uh, perhaps the Senate budget passed today. I don't know that as a fact, but let's talk about the House budget. The House was committed to raising teacher pay. The House has been committed to a long-term teacher pay increase for some time. It began six years ago when we raised the, the pay for new teachers, we saw very clearly, and it was as well based on recommendation of some 75 plus teachers from across the state at various points in their career, new teachers, mid-career teachers, veteran teachers, that we needed to do something to, to attract and retain high quality new teachers, get people into the profession. So we raised beginning teacher salary, we and started to move into raising mid-career salary. Four, two years ago, we raised mid-career salaries. And this year, the House budget includes a significant raise for veteran teacher salaries. This was all part of a plan we committed to six years ago, eight years ago. So that's one piece. Second piece is that we're committed to early education. We all agree that that we've got a lot of kids that begin school not ready to learn. Well, these kids that start school behind, sadly, stay behind. In fact, frequently fall further behind as they go through school. Uh, go through school. So early education was a key issue for the house. Nextly, and, and this is in no particular order, but, but the things that are coming to my mind as I'm speaking, we know that we have to improve teacher professional development. Professional development had unfortunately denigrated or was denigrated into a point of being nothing more than how to fill out another form. What's the latest rule we have to comply with? Instead of true professional development, which is improving the skill of the teacher. Now, so, so we were committed significant money to improving skills. We also looked at such projects as lab schools, laboratory schools, a project that we began, a program we began four years ago, which is really tied with our schools of education, where we're asking our schools of education to actually partner with a local school in their area, particularly a, a school that's traditionally been underperforming, and use that school as a laboratory for teaching teachers how to teach, lab schools. Now, personally, I think we, our reach exceeded our grasp, and we need to make some adjustments to that. And there were our adjustments in the house bill to the lab school program. Teaching fellows. Back in 2011, 2012, when this state was pushing $3 billion in the hole, we eliminated a lot of important programs, including teaching fellows. Teaching fellows was a terrific program highly recognized, but it was expensive. And frankly, we didn't have any money. So we eliminated teaching fellows. We brought that, we brought teaching fellows back two years ago, but we brought it back on a limited basis. The house budget expands the number of institutions involving teaching fellows. We need to continue to improve our teaching, improve and expand the teaching fellows project. The house budget also brought back master's pay for teachers. That was another program we had to eliminate in the recession was a master stipend for teachers. Now, when we were eliminated master stipend, there was actually, it wasn't just a shot from the hip. The fact of the matter is that every bit of data that we had been given showed that there was no improvement in student outcomes, no improvement in student outcomes when teachers got their master's degree. Now, I got to tell you, as an appropriations guy, and as a legislator, a Mr. Everyman, I want to know what I'm getting for what I'm paying. And if I'm not getting improved student outcomes, I'm not paying for it. So we eliminated master pay. But that was one of the things that contributed to the decline in enrollment 
and teacher prep programs. It also contributed, of course, to the decline in enrollment of master's program in our universities, and our universities love master's programs. Those are profitable to universities. So we're saying to the universities, kick your program up. Give us something for what we're paying. We want more out of teachers graduating with a master's degree. We expect more from them when they get into the classroom. So kick it up. Especially if we're paying for it. Especially if we're paying for it. So the, the House restored master's pay. Now that's a bit of a bet on the come. It's also a bit of an attraction for people to come back into the teaching profession. North Carolina, as most states in this nation, is suffering greatly from a dramatic decline in new teachers. Teachers are not entering the profession. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. It's not just pay. Now, certainly pay has a lot to do with it. I mean, nobody goes into the teaching profession expecting to become a millionaire, but we do expect to, to at least pay our bills and, and, and drive a decent car and go on vacation from time to time. But frankly, North Carolina had, had consistently fallen off the radar, if you will, on pay for teachers. So we've begun to restore that pay, which is helping to attract teachers. But I'll tell you what's hurting teachers more, help hurting the teaching profession more than anything, it's the press. And the reason I say that is everywhere you turn, there's a story about how terrible things are for teachers. Go talk to a teacher who will tell you how proud they are to be a teacher. Go talk to a teacher to tell you how proud they are to be able to contribute to a kid, how fulfilled they are. It's a fulfilling profession. It is the most marvelous profession in the world, being a teacher. Wow. You are touching the future. We need to be talking about how great the teaching profession is. And with that, yes, we need to improve teacher pay. We need to improve teacher working conditions. But by and large, teachers don't leave a job. By and large, teachers leave principal or an administrator because they're they're not being they don't have their back so along with improving things for teachers we have to significantly improve things for principals we need to do a better job of training and supporting principals we need better principals in our schools and we've got a lot of great principals but we've got a lot and we've got a lot of great teachers but we've also got a lot of folks that shouldn't be principals and we got a lot of folks that shouldn't be teachers like every other profession like every other profession. But we need to be paying attention to that. And that leads me into another project that's in the, in the House budget, and that's advanced teaching roles. This is a project that we began six years ago, uh, advanced teaching roles. And what is the concept behind advanced teaching roles? The concept is that we want to be able to attract and retain high quality teachers in the classroom. And today, in order for a teacher to advance their career, They've got to get out of the classroom and go into, into some type of administration. So advanced teaching role creates an opportunity for teachers to stay in the classroom, stay engaged with their students, stay engaged with other teachers, and enhance their career. That's the concept behind, behind advanced teaching role. If you take on more responsibility, if you contribute more to, to, to student gains, then we're going to pay you more because you're going to earn more. And then the other thing that advanced teaching roles does, that which is critically important, is it deals with the management structure inside the schoolhouse. By and large, the management structure inside the schoolhouse is everybody reports to the principal. That's really pretty much it. Now, a lot of schools say, well, we have a system principal for this and a system principal for that, and we have a curriculum coordinator, we have this, we have that. But by and large, the reality is everybody reports to the principal. Well, that's a terrible management model. Any management system will show you, any management curriculum will show you that span of control should be nine to 13 people. That you really can't effectively manage more than about 13 people. Now it depends on the people, depends on the conditions, depends on lots of things. But it doesn't include managing 100 people or more in large schools. So that's the second piece of the advanced teaching roles model is to change the management structure inside the schoolhouse. And that's in the house budget. And the last thing, I want to go back to early education. We've got a, a terrific early ed program in North Carolina. Smart Start and NC Pre-K really are poster child children for high quality, hands-on, face-to-face education. 
Now, we need to get more of our four and five star uh, uh, child care facilities into NC Pre-K. And that means we need to be paying more, frankly, in order for them to be able to afford it. And we need to be asking more, but we also have to do some other things. And not the least of which is a program that, that I'm championing. And I, I realize it's a little self-serving, but I, this I think is important. I just mentioned that NC Pre-K and Smart Start are tremendous programs. And we want every kid in North Carolina to be involved in, in, in dealing with the readiness gap. The readiness gap is, are they ready for school when school starts? As, when kindergarten begins, are they ready? Uh, are they ready? Because we got a lot of kids that aren't. We know, we know, it's, it's a proven fact that we've got kids that have heard 30 million 30 million fewer words than other kids by the time they, those kids start kindergarten. 30 million. There are, there's plenty of evidence. Now, your ability to think includes the words you know. You can't think about things you don't have a word to describe it. So vocabulary is really important. Colors, counting, really important. And that's what we accomplish in NC Pre-K and Swartzman. But you know, we've got thousands of kids in this state that do not, do not have access to NC Pre-K or Smart Start. And not because we don't fund it sufficiently, although we don't fund it sufficiently, not because it's not available and it's not available everywhere, but because illness, family issues, transportation, whatever. Thousands of kids that cannot access school readiness programs. What are we going to do with those kids? Because those kids need it more than anybody. Those are going to be farm hands. We can't have that. Those are going to be kids that are going to grow up to be permanently on welfare. We cannot, as a state, have that. So I've got an idea. Looked around the country to see who's dealing with this. And, there, and interestingly, I came up with a program that began in Utah, but it's now in, I believe, 11 states called Upstart. And it's a parent involved, coach supported and technology supported pre-k for those kids that don't know that do not have otherwise do not otherwise have access to pre-k so in the house budget is a little bit less just under a million dollars to pilot this upstart program in north carolina i've been watching this program for four years i've seen a success in utah and indiana and now recently in south carolina and the kids, these kids that would not normally have access are flourishing with Upstart. And that program is in the house budget. And then one more, one last thing. I said Upstart was the last thing. Now one more thing that's, that's in the budget, the house and I believe will be in the Senate budget. And that is we're all concerned about life skills. We're all concerned that we've got kids graduating from high school with truly unprepared unprepared for life. Now they may be really smart kids, but how many of those kids know the difference between a debit card and a credit card? How many of those kids think that if they can afford the payment, they can afford the product? How many of those kids understand the miracle, both positive and negative, of compound interest? And I submit to you that not very many. So we're going to require that the kids entering high school in 1920 this fall, that sometime during their high school career, they have to take a full credit course in economics and financial literacy. Yes, a full credit course in economics and financial literacy. So that they graduate knowing how to balance a checkbook, knowing that you better take a look at the income you're going to earn when you get a degree that you're going to pay sixty or a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, and find out that the income that that degree will get you doesn't pay the interest on the college loans you took out. We need to get people back in the middle of the road and understanding the responsibility of money. That is in the house budget. So I'm pretty proud of what we've done in the house budget. Have we answered every question? Of course not. Is it a perfect system? Of course not. Can we do better? Of course we can. But let's get started. We're a legislator. We're a legislature. 
That's 120 members of the House and 70 members of the Senate. They come from all over the state with all kinds of backgrounds. We're not going to agree on everything. There are going to be some things that are more important to one than they are to another. But we've got to come out with something. We are elected to lead, not just sit with our ear to the ground. We're elected to make decisions and take responsibility. So let's get on with it. We're going to make mistakes. We're human beings. But we can correct them. But the worst thing we can do is nothing. Do nothing. Then get rid of us. Are there any initiatives to, and if you guys have any questions, please you know jump in. Are there any initiatives to um, introduce efficiency models into um, the public education system? Maybe an audit of DPI, for example, or something you know maybe less revolutionary than that, but something along those lines. I, I mean, in terms of expanding teacher roles, I mean that's beautiful what you guys are doing, but is there any, is there any focus on that? Because a lot of the money gets sucked up by this administration and people like myself ask, what value does an extra 15, 20 bureaucratic positions, what value does that add to the classroom? That's been a real challenge in education, probably as much as it's been in transportation. We all kind of laugh about the transportation budget because we conjure up in our mind We've got nine people standing around a hole while one guy's in there with a shovel. You got a guy with a clipboard, a guy with a stopwatch, a guy with a first aid kit, a guy with a telephone. Everybody standing around watching one guy do the work. Well, we see that in education as well because we are measuring everything, we're testing everything, everything's being evaluated constantly. And you know, I, I've, I just realized I failed to address school safety, which we spent, we have dedicated a lot of money to school safety. But that's another area where we can get top heavy very, very quickly with lots of administration and precious little action. So we have no question, we have got to add significant efficiency to the delivery of education. And the delivery of education happens in the classroom, not in the boardroom. The delivery of education happens with teachers and kids. That's where the rubber meets the road. And we look around and we have seen administration grow exponentially while we now are actually to a point where our student population has leveled off and is beginning to decline. But our administration, administrative population continues to go up dramatically. Now, a lot of that, quite frankly, in my opinion, is because we chase money. We chase a grant, we chase a stipend, we chase this, that, or the other, and every one of those grants, well, every one of those foundation stipends come with, well, we need some kind of administration. We need a report, we need this, we need to stand on your left foot, turn around three times, and we have administrated ourselves into a mess. And we need, we, for me, we've lost our focus on the simplest of things, student outcomes. With me, it's all about student outcomes. Frankly, I don't care about your politics and I don't care about your administration. I care about your student outcomes. And if you're getting me student outcomes, I'll go through fire for you. If you're not, I'll do everything I can to see you find another way to make a living. Because it's only about student outcomes. And we have lost that focus. Do you, oh, no, please. I'm going to get back to a pet topic that we spoke about earlier. This idea of actually investigating what the federal government is costing us in our education outcomes. Yes, and a few years ago, we had an attempt to, to do a study on what does it cost for us to be, to take money. And that, unfortunately, that attempt fell short because it was, nobody delivered on it. And we're asking that question again. And the most dramatic one of those questions was around the $400 million that the state got for race to the top, 400 million bucks. And it probably cost us 500 million bucks to fill out forms, administrate, report, stand on one foot three times, what color is this, who's wearing a dunce hat. I mean, it's, the thing is ridiculous. We did the same thing with Common Core. We chased money and we made a mess of what started out as being actually a sensible idea and got lost because the federal government stepped in and threw money at it and we chased that money. Quick follow up, real quick follow up. Sure. 
in talking to some people in my local school district, I started asking the question, how many of these reporting programs or data programs or fill out the form programs, are we still doing that have already eclipsed out? In other words, the the grant was a four-year grant. Right. And what we're and still the, doing. And, and, and because the administration was put in place and these reports were being done, well, we can't we can't take a chance that we've got administrators gonna lose their jobs. So we're just gonna keep doing it. And now we're and now that, we're taking this, the, the local and state money out of the classroom. And so, yes, that has happened. We've moved we moved the chairs around. We we might have changed the title for an individual, but are we still chasing some of these same things? Absolutely, we are. We started with no child left behind. That moved into every every student succeeds. No, that's the SSA. That's the newest one. Is that every student succeeds? Yeah. So race to the top was in between. Yeah, race to the top. That was the, wasn't that the first one, or was that the second? No. I, there's so many of these. Federal programs are federal people to keep throwing money. And as soon as they throw money, you know that comes, here comes this book full of forms that you've got to fill out and test results that you've got to produce. And all the rest of the nonsense, when we've lost sight of the student, we've lost sight of what are we teaching the kid? Have we given thought to re-examining outcome measures with that in mind? Like well, matriculation we rates, to, employment rates, et cetera? We need to be doing that. We need to be doing lots of stuff. Uh, I'm a little frustrated. I'm, not, I'm a lot frustrated. It's very clear. I'm, I'm not an educator. I've never been an educator. I don't know what it's like to week in and week out to stand in front of a class of second graders or, or God forbid, sophomores in high school. Uh, I remember what I was like. How in the world do you ever deal with those? But how do you do that year after year and motivate teachers? so that they can motivate kids. And we're still stuck trying to figure out how to meet the requirements of some grant somewhere along the line, well-meaning as it might be. And then you hire people, and well, okay, I hired my sister's uncle to count how many pencils do they use in a given day, in a given, really? Who cares, except pencils cost a lot of money and somebody needs to keep track of them and the next thing you know, we that person that we've hired to count pencil needs, a, needs an assistant. So that they can, the assistant has to actually fill out the report while the, while the first person counts the pencils and, and the next thing you know, well, we've got to, we're gonna add some more schools so the assistant needs some assistance and then the money runs out, well, we can't fire all these people, what are they gonna do? So we find another project. This is crazy. And we're doing it. How much of our budget do you think is tied up in, in that sort of stuff? Well, as a businessman, having run a multi-million dollar company, and I should say help run, I had two partners. I, I'm confident there's anywhere from 12 to 25% I'm going to tell you, I don't care what the company is. I don't care how efficient the company is. It's got a good 10% of waste built in. Just built in. Because that, I, I look at a, I was in a restaurant business. The garbage can was my enemy. The, that's where my profits went. I paid, I, I broke even making sandwiches. The profit was in that last piece of bologna or turkey breast. And no, nah, it's too hard to deal with, so we'll throw that away. Well, that's where I actually made my money. I just broke even with everything else. Don't tell me that doesn't happen in that's obviously we're not throwing kids. Well, I shouldn't say we're not throwing kids away because I, sometimes I think we are throwing kids away. Yes, we we give up on them. We decide because of the color of their skin or their zip code or the kind of clothes they wear that they can or can't learn. We, we decide that when they walk in the door. Yeah, we're throwing kids away. And we're throwing kids away because we're too busy filling out forms. We don't have enough people to do this out of the other. And a lot of that, if you continue to drill down, it's the family. The family's so busy trying to pay their bills and, and have a life, and they're telling them, here's 20 bucks, leave me alone. Families are not reading to their kids. They're not showing up at PTA meetings. They're not 
doing the stuff that we as parents and our parents did, which helped reduce costs on the school so that they could actually deliver an education to a kid. What a concept. We're here to deliver an education to a kid, really? No, I thought we were here to fill out a form. No, we're actually here to deliver an education to a kid. What a concept. So what is the percentage of waste? I don't know. But anybody tries to tell me we're not wasting money, I know it's lying to me because it's just not human nature. It's just, come on. And when you talk about 20%, and what's our total education budget at the moment? Let's well, see. the total education budget is pushing $13 billion. There we go. I mean, that's a lot. You know, 1% of $13 billion is a lot of money. And I'm saying as much as 20%, eh, that may be overstated. But, if it's, but I, actually, I don't think it's overstated. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and look, I, I give people all the do all do respect, but we can do better. And the reality is we can do a lot better. Now, part of it, frankly, it's our own fault. It's our own fault. We elect these people. We elect people like me based on what? Because I sent you a mailer? Because I waved to you from a car? Because your uncle's brother saw me someplace and said, yeah, he's a nice guy, go for it. Really? That's why you voted for me? I submit to you that 40% of the people that vote for an individual candidate don't even know the candidate. Never met him, don't know him. I heard his name someplace, or her name. And 40% of the people who vote against you, same thing. Never heard of them, don't know anything about them, but I don't like them. Because their name is funny, I can't pronounce it, because they're green or orange or or they go with the, ah, some stupid reason, I'm sorry, but it's a stupid reason. We need to elect and support better candidates. We talk about teacher pay. Here in North Carolina, we pay legislators 13 grand a year. 13 grand a year. Let me say that once more, 13 grand a year. I'm spending 70 hours a week working on this stuff for 13 grand a year. I lose somewhere between fifteen dollars and $25,000 a year out of my pocket to be a legislator. A lot of people are saying, well, you know, that's you know, it's public service and that's part of the deal. Okay, yeah, it sure is public service part of the deal. But if we're going to attract and retain high-quality legislators, we can't ask them to come and spend money out of their pocket to take the grief that we give them. That's just reality. How am I going to attract a young person with a family and a business to come to Raleigh for six, seven months at a time and put up with a nonsense for 13 grand a year. Now, I want to get off that. I don't want to dwell on what we pay legislators. My point is that we, the electorate, need to demand better candidates, support them, talk to them. Not at them, talk to them. I was on the phone before I came here with, with someone that called to talk about state employee pay. Not teacher pay, state employee pay. And that the Senate has a 1%, I believe this, she told me, the Senate has a 1% raise. I don't, I know there isn't much of a raise in state employees. And I will tell you, in North Carolina, our prison guards and our state police, lowest paid in the United States. Now, I volunteered in prisons for four or five years. Let me tell you something. Being a prison guard is probably the worst job I can possibly imagine. I mean, the worst job I can imagine. And these people are working 12 on and 12 off because we don't have enough prison guards. And we're not going to have enough prison guards in, and we're going to give them a 1% raise. Really? Why don't we just spit in their face? Because that's about what it is. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, we've got to attract, retain, support, talk to our legislators. Not just tell them what idiots they are. We've got to demand better people ask harder questions and look at results. Look at results, what a concept. Outcomes, same thing I talked to Will about students. When are we going to start focusing on student outcomes, not just graduation rates? Now, I'm sorry, but graduation rates, yes, they're important, but graduation rates happen to have a direct correlation to the to the difficulty of the curriculum. 
and the stridentness, the expertise of the teacher. So I'm not always impressed with graduation rates. Well, graduation know. rates can be gamed too, like GPAs. There's we, there's yeah. there's a lot of reports of teachers being told that they can't give the kids below a 50 That's and right. because we need a certain GPA so we can all get our bonuses. And so it, you're putting another problem with bonuses. Now I I'm an incentives guy. I love incentives. I I'm an old sales guy. You give me you better pay me a bonus for selling more of this than that. I'm gonna sell that. The heck with selling this. Yeah. I'm gonna be selling the stuff that pays the most. So I believe in incentives. I believe in rewards. But we've got to be somewhat careful about that in education because we are the sum of all of our parts. That is to say, I do well in fourth grade because I had a good third grade teacher that prepared me for fourth grade. I do well in math, in advanced math, because I had a really good teacher last year in, in basic math that gave me the tools to be ready for advanced math. I'm a good teacher because I surround myself with good teachers and I learn from them, which makes me a better teacher. So as much as I like incentives and I like bonuses, we're going to be a bit careful with that. We don't just throw it out there. No, that didn't work well. There's got more to it than that. We must be much more thoughtful. But I still like, you know, I want to reward people that take on additional responsibilities, advanced teaching roles. I like that idea where a master teacher works with teachers that are, that are struggling, newer teachers, younger teachers, and helps raise the bar for everyone and get that master teacher in front of as many kids as possible. Our goal should always be to get the most number of kids in front of the best, num the best teachers in our state and get the best teachers in our state in front of the most number of kids at every level. What a concept. <laughs> but that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. Over the last five years, because um, I think we're trying to send one of our own to Congress right now, um, what the Republican legislature, I don't think, gets enough credit for what it's done for education since since we uh, wow. took over. What do you think some of the most significant accomplishments are over the last, let's say, you know, four or five years? Well, uh, first thing I'd always point to is, is our growth in teacher pay. When when I first got involved in education in North Carolina, North Carolina was. Uh, anywhere from, depending on who you talk to, somewhere in the 40s in the, in the country in teacher pay. We were pushing toward the bottom in, in teacher pay. And now, depending on which study you, you read, it could be as low, we could be as high as 20th in the nation, or perhaps more in the early 30s, depending on how, whether you consider cost of living and, and, and other things. And nobody seems to ever talk about our benefit package, which is among the best in the nation for teachers. Uh, we're, I'm very proud of the benefit package, by the way, which is fully funded in North Carolina. The teachers are, gonna, are going to, they can depend on those benefits. Not only like seven states can the teachers depend on the benefit package that's offered to them. So I'm pretty proud of that. I'm pretty proud of the fact that we have improved the opportunities for teachers to grow in their career, advanced teaching roles being one, but not the only one, by implementing uh, new options in the delivery of education, including opportunity scholarships, including charter schools, including more options so that we can get an education that fits the needs of a kid, rather than saying all kids fit into this square hole. We need options so that parents can say, you know, this school isn't working for my kid. I need to find something that works better for them. Now, I believe in public education. I also believe in charter school education, private education. I believe in education and whoever can deliver it the best for an individual kid. So I think the Republican legislature has moved decisively to expand the options on education. I'm getting a lot of grief over virtual charter schools. We have two virtual charter schools in this state. But we've got kids where it's just not working out for them in a school, any school, whether it's a bullying issue, a, because they're in sports and they travel a lot, maybe they're a military family, because of illness, etc. So what am I supposed to do for those kids, offer them nothing? No, we're, we're testing the concept of a virtual charter school. We've got two of them underway. 
two different deliverers. Let's see how that works out. Now, so far, has it blown the numbers up? No. But talk to the kids. The kids are getting something out of this. That should be the, the, the litmus test. Not are the adults happy. I don't really care whether the adults are happy. I, don't want, I need a kid learning stuff. And this is one of the tools in the toolbox. So we've done that. We have, we have added, uh, we have added, I think, greatly to our, our, our community college options and our higher education options with need-based funding, uh, need-based scholarships for both our independent colleges and universities, as well as for, even for some private schools. We've got, we have uh, really focused on career and college ready for kids in high school that can earn college credit while they're still in high school, saving their parents thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Because those a lot of kids are entering college today with a full year already under their belt. <coughs> That's going to save their families a lot of money. We continue to do things to drive down the cost of college in North Carolina for North Carolinians. Uh, we have arguably some of the best colleges in the world here in North Carolina. And I don't think it's arguable. I think our UNC system and our independent colleges, Duke University, Wake Forest, Montreat, right here in Union County, Wingate University, we've got some marvelous small colleges, independent colleges. We've got the second largest community college system in the nation, 58 community colleges that are now working very well with our universities and higher education and secondary education, high school education, to deliver programs that are designed so that kids can get a job and have a future, have an opportunity. We've got to continue to expand those opportunities in North Carolina for more kids reaching them. We need to focus on getting education to kids, not kids to education. The reality is that with that gadget you have in your hand on which you're filming this, we can deliver the finest education in the world to the poorest and most rural kid. We can do that if we're willing. We're not always willing. Does that present some problems? You betcha it presents some problems and challenges. But you know what? We're up for those. We can deal with those problems and challenges. But we're only going to deal with them when we stop throwing rocks at each other. Stop the finger wag and start figuring out how do we meet the needs of the kid? Because we've got way too many jobs with nobody to fill them, and too, way too many kids with no skills. And we've got to bring that together. Instead of this, we've got to get that. How long did we have to wait for an articulation agreement between our community colleges and our universities? That's ridiculous. That's nothing but ego getting in the way. We need articulation between our high schools and our middle schools. We need articulation between our high schools and our community colleges. We particularly need our articulation between our early education people and our K-5 people. I'm reminded when I first got into education, we had this phenomenon of an increasing number of kids taking driver's ed and an increasing number of kids failing the driver's test. What? <clears throat> How does that work? What we're teaching isn't what they're asking. Are we preparing our youngest learners for K-5? We weren't. We're beginning to. Were we, or are our high school kids being prepared for post-high school education? No. No. And is our post-high school education delivery? And with all due respect to psychology majors, you're not going to make a whole heck of a lot of money being a psychology major. <laughs> no, you will not. <laughs> so, I mean, it might give you the warm fuzzies, but... It's a good elective. It's a good elective. Uh, oh, and I'm sorry, and I have a granddaughter that's a psychology major, and very proud of being a psychology major, but she did call me and say, I can't find a job as a psychology major. She's got to go back to school. I my master's in Stop. something else. Duh. My point is, where are we going? We have to decide where we're going as a state, as a nation. Where are we going? Because if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Well, where is there? And we have to work together. There has to be, 
the continuum of education. And that continuum begins before the child's even born. We already know that an expectant mother that reads to her baby that's not even yet born has a better chance. That child has a better chance. We already know that. There's data to prove that. We, it starts before the child is born, and it goes for the rest of their lives. You know, it's not like with my parents who worked for one company all their lives. In fact, as we were proud of the fact, I'm a, I've been with this company for 35 years. I'm proud of that. We get a 35-year pen, get a watch. Well, the employer figured out that we were, we were the watch chief. But today... We're trying to prepare kids for jobs that haven't been invented. And today, education, in my opinion, my opinion, education is no longer about the transfer of knowledge. All the knowledge you want is available in that thing. It's called GTS, Google that stuff. Some people think it means something like not exactly. But anyway, <laughs> knowledge is cheap. You can find knowledge in the flash of an eye. If you've got one of those little Azalea or whatever they call those little bot it's hey Azalea, how much is in how many ounces in a Alexa or oh, right, so that's not how Azalea. Right, it was one of those. Uh, hey Google, what what's the weather forecast for tomorrow? What's five times nine? Give me a give me a recipe for spaghetti. You can find knowledge is you can find knowledge. What you can't find is how to use knowledge. And that's what we need. We need to help our teachers understand that that's a huge part of their job now is to teaching an individual kid how to use knowledge, where to get it, how to be critical of it, how to compare it, and how to use knowledge, not just transfer knowledge. Knowledge is a wonderful thing, but it stands alone until you start applying knowledge. How do we work together? How do we collaborate as well as cooperate? How do we talk to each other? What's happened to civil discourse? It's going into the dump. So there's, this is a challenging time for all of us and it costs a lot of money. And when you're dealing as, as I'm dealing now with, with not millions, but billions of dollars, a $2 million grant is a rounding error. Really, in a, in a $13 billion budget, if I'm off by $2 million, I probably wouldn't even see that in the numbers because we're going to talk about $13.4 billion, which is $13,400,000,000. Million. $2 million gets lost. I, I can't believe it. I've got legislators that say to me, well, it's only $2 million. How can the word only and million be in the same sentence? <laughs> What about where they grew up? <laughs> but we do it. And we're asking people like us, people that, you know, I'm a former food salesman. We're asking people like us to come to Raleigh and make these kind of decisions. And we're surprised when we screw it up. Really? Well, I'm a human being. So how do we do this? We do it by working together, by creating a mutual vision where we're going by cooperating and collaborating and not throwing each other under the bus. We can disagree and we need to learn how to disagree and that's an art form. Well, speaking, I mean, not, not speaking of disagreement, but for, for people, the taxpayers, the voters out there, are there any particular pieces of legislation? You said that they passed a budget and you're all going to sit down. Is there anything in education that, that you'd like to see happen that you anticipate some pushback on that people that you know, are passionate about this, can maybe call up and advocate for any specific bill they should be calling their legislator up and saying, why don't you vote for this? Or well, I do suggest that they, they do read the press reports on the budget. Because that's, at, at the end of the day, it still comes down to money. I hate it because I ask particularly teachers all the time, is it just the money? Really? Is that the only thing we've got to talk about? Because there are policies. What are our expectations? And how do we get there? How do we achieve that? So, sure, I would love the public to take up advocating for advanced teaching roles. There needs to be more ways for teachers 
to enhance their career and not force them out of the classroom. I, I've had no one in the public say to me that that's important to them. But there's a House bill right now sitting at the Senate yep. that does the expanded teacher rules. Yep. The same thing with early education initiatives. We've got people saying, oh, don't try that because it, it may not work. Well, nothing ever worked until it was tried. And then we run out of patience because it didn't work instantly. Really? How's that worked in your life? Have you had instant gratification on everything you've done? Or did you lay out a long-term plan? Well, what is the long-term plan? What do you see? You, the average taxpayer, the average person, if there is such a thing as an average person, where do you see this country in 10 years? Where do you want to see this country in 10 years? And what are the things that you think we need to be doing that's going to get us there? And recognizing we're not going to get there overnight. There is no light switch for good legislation. There's no light switch for life. Well, we'll just do this. Click. Ah, all fixed. There's no book. I can't go to page 17, line 4, and there's the answer. Life is a crapshoot. We're trying our best. Be creative. One thing I do know, and I'm going to quote the name of a book. It's the title of a book. Book is okay, not the greatest book, but it's a good. But the title's terrific. Here's the title. What got you here won't get you there. The talents it took to get you from wherever you started to wherever you are now are quite frankly a different set of talents you're going to need in order to get you from where you are now into some point in the future. What are those new talents? I don't know. I don't know. And nor does anyone else. And my crystal ball is no better. But I, we've got to accept the fact that we're going to try some things, we're going to fail at some things, and we're going to parlay our successes and stop throwing each other under the bus. That's cheap talk, actually, sadly, because it's easy to say, hard to do. We, uh, it's amazing how patient we are with our own mistakes and so impatient with the mistakes of others. How patient we are with our own families or our own team when we're going to take the same things that our family does or our team does and throw the other guy under the bus for doing it. Really. That's ridiculous. But we do it. Now, it's not going to, we're not going to change that overnight. We live in a contentious time. But the only way we're going to get out of it is when we take it up the mantle. We get a lot of people that are wringing their hands about how terrible things are. You know something? Things aren't terrible at all. Things are actually pretty good. Because I remember when I came home from the service in 1969, and National Guard people were shooting students. And there were race riots and anti-war riots in the streets all over this country. I don't think things are bad at all. I think things are pretty darn good. We have the lowest unemployment we've had in decades, if not maybe right. for some people, ever. We've got low interest rates. We've got technology that can accomplish almost anything. Every option is open to every one of us. Why in the world are we bringing our hands? Look at the rest of the world. Now, we're approaching D-Day. The 75th anniversary of one of the most dramatic events in the history of the world, D-Day, when a bunch of sick, sick, throwing up country boys from Iowa and Pennsylvania and Oklahoma bounced around in the water and attacked the beach. And the enemy had the high ground, had shorter supply lines, had better weapons and more ammunition. There's no reason for those country bumpkins those hicks to have been successful on Omaha Beach on D-Day. You know why they were successful? Because the individual American fighting men said, this ain't working, let's go do that. The rest of the world sits and waits for order. The rest of the world sits and waits to be told. We should be very proud of who we are, where we are, how we're doing. We should be really proud of it and anxious to make the next mistake so that we can improve on it instead of anxious for the other guy to make the next mistake so we can shove it down his throat. Because that's what we're doing. This is a great time to be alive. There are more ways to make a living than ever in the history of the world. Guess what? Tomorrow, 
there will be even more ways to make a living than ever in the history of the world. These are the best of times, not the worst of times. And so why aren't kids coming into teaching? Because we're telling them how terrible it is. Well, that teaching is not terrible. Teaching is a marvelous profession. Are you going to make a lot of money? No, I'm sorry you're not. Never have, I suspect, never will. Should you make more money? Absolutely. But the joy, what you can do, the impact you can have, there's nothing, nothing better than being a teacher. So we can do this. We must do And North Carolina, more than any other state, it's a great place to live. The weather's marvelous. The taxes are low. We've got plenty of room. There's lots to do and see. The mountains, the seashore. It's an incredible place. We're not going to blow out the park. Why do I have to leave North Carolina to hear what a wonderful place we are? Because when I stay here, I'm, I'm told what how terrible things are. Really? I go to conferences all over the country and in some cases around the world, and they all say, wow, you guys in North Carolina are really doing great work. I come home and I'm, sitting, I'm told what an idiot I am. How does that do for motivation? I don't know about anybody else, but it doesn't do much for me. But that's life. As I was told as a freshman legislator, I remember a veteran legislator, I went in to complain about somebody did something, said something, blah, blah, blah. and the legislator said to me, the fact is, she said, put on your iron pants and get out of my office. Suck it up, boy. <laughs> I remember that very, very well. That legislator's still there. Anybody who knows the legislature can probably figure out who that woman was and is. But that was good advice. This is tough. This is really hard. Everybody can do better than you can do. At least they think so. They read about it in the book someplace. Right. <laughs> it's the hardest thing I've ever tried. It's herding cats, 120 members of the House, 50 members of the Senate, the press, interest groups. Everybody thinks they can do this better than everybody else. Well, that's human nature. We didn't get in here, get to this point overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. But one thing for sure, I'll go back and I'll wrap up by saying, what got us here won't get us there. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you.